So we're going to go ahead and continue on with the advanced flight control system. And the last thing we talked about was the aft landing gear proximity switch. And that should take you to page um, actually 13 is where we finished off with the ground contact lights on the maintenance panel. Any questions about that? If not, the next thing we're going to talk about is the thrust CCDA. Keeping in mind, gentlemen, we pretty much have already highlighted what the thrust CCDA does, the purpose of it, right? This is how the advanced flight control computer, why computer? Which one actually interacts with altitude hold? Number one. The number one computer. That's going to become very, very relevant later on when we get into emergency procedures. And a lot of operator's manual cautions are getting ready to come up. And you'll notice that if we lose the number one system, they tell you to be aware of possible thrust runaway, possible over torque, over temp, over speed situations. Why? Because what you're going to find out is that thrust CCDA has 100% authority. It does not adhere to any control limitations. All it knows is one thing. You told it to maintain an altitude, and that's what it's going to do. Whether it's bare altitude hold or rate altimeter hold is irrelevant. As a result of the thrust CCDA being moved, what else can we anticipate, gentlemen? What else is going to happen? As the ASCS computers are going to be manipulating that thrust CCDA. Your controls up in the cockpit are actually going to move. The thrust control is actually going to move as a result of those inputs. So the whole time altitude hold is on, with your hand on that thrust control, you're going to feel your hand going up and down. Why? Because you're going to feel it making those little nitinoid inputs to correct and maintain altitude for you. And you have to allow for it to happen. Now, let's go ahead and just make sure any input that happens below the integrated lower control actuators, the ILCAs, any input that happens below the ILCA, you are going to see it and you are going to feel it on the controls. Anything that happens at the ILCAs, the integrated lower control actuators, any input that happens there is only going to affect the output side of those integrated lower control actuators, so therefore you are not going to see it or feel it. Which, why, what, which is why it's important that you understand exactly what is being manipulated by the computers for what function, because depending on what's being manipulated, you can anticipate those control movements, or you can anticipate not having those control inputs. And reality is for motion dampening, for stability about all axis, you're not going to feel those changes as per the way the system set up except for altitude hold. Keeping in mind that the only time we have altitude hold capability is when? When do we have altitude hold capability? Okay. And it's selected. If nothing is selected, this aircraft has no other automatic features for maintaining altitude. Does everybody understand that? It's something that you have to engage it, whether it's right altimeter hold or bare altitude hold is irrelevant. As long as you understand that there is no other type of altitude hold feature. Now what kind of gives the appearance that the aircraft's maintaining altitude for you? The mag brake. So when you put it at a certain altitude, it may seem like it has an altitude hold, but the only thing it is is it's the mag brake holding that thrust control. And in holding that thrust control, it's going to hold it pretty close to what you want. Does everybody understand that? But there's no other automatic feature. Okay, there's your maintenance panel. In looking at your maintenance panel, the only thing relative to AFCS is what? 
on this panel. What is the only thing associated with AFCS on this panel that we talked about? Ground the ground contact light. So these two ground contact lights, those are the only thing associated with AFCS. And that just helps us identify which system is having a problem. That's all that does. Okay. Reality is, you're going to know that we may be having problems with proximity switches because why? How do you as a pilot know? Caution. Not caution. What's going to happen as a result of these lights cycling on and off? Your LCTs are going to be programming. They're either going to be in the ground box or retracted. Ground or retracted. Or of course when we're starting to increase our airspeed, then they'll start to program to the airspeed. But right now, the only thing the ground contact lights and the proximity switches are doing is telling those AFCS computers, yes, I'm on the ground, go to the ground box, or no, I'm in the air, go ahead and retract at this point. Because why? Because later on, when we talk about the way that it programs the airspeed, it's using what system? What did we say? How is airspeed detected by the system itself? What's it using? The P.Static system. The P -static system. What do I know about the P.Static system? Unreliable below. It's unreliable below 40 knots. So therefore, we had to have something else in there to tell the AFCS computers whether the aircraft was on the ground or in the air. And the proximity switches is what does that. We have two AFCS computers. We started off saying that both these computers are completely identical. You can put the number one computer in the number two slot and vice versa. Now, although we highlighted the fact that there is one feature that is unique to the number one AFCS, and that's which feature? Altitude hold. Why? It's because of the wiring connections that causes that, not because of the computer itself. Each one of those, car each one of those computers has 11 cards. Each one of those computers can do exactly the same thing. Now why is it kind of important that we highlight it? Because in some aircrafts you may see a tag on there saying number two only. And the reason for that is because if we have a problem with just altitude hold, and we determine that it's an internal computer problem, they'll just swap those two computers out, label the one number two only after doing a maintenance test flight and verifying it, and then from then on out that computer until we can fix it, it's just going to be used as a number two only. Because <coughs> again, just because one feature goes bad doesn't mean we have to get rid of the whole computer. As you look at the computers, you'll notice that we got two major electrical connections and then we have a whole series of PDOT tubes. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the signals that are coming into those computers to be processed so that it knows what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And the first thing we're going to talk about, of course, is your PDOT static system. Starting off and highlighting your PDOT system. We know PDOT system is going to be used for what process? For what? Airspeed. Airspeed. And watch this. This is the other thing that has to be highlighted. That left tube is going to go to the number one AFCS computer. <coughs> that right tube is going to go to the number two AFCS computer. But not only is it going to go to the computer, it's going to go to the airspeed indicating system. But notice that it's not the airspeed indicating system that's going to the computer. It's the same airflow that's going to both systems. Why? That way if the airspeed indicator goes belly up, it's not going to affect the computer. Now if we lose the PDOT static system, then we will lose both systems. Does everybody understand that? And so the right tube, as we said, is going to do the same thing. Keeping in mind that the left tube is going to which airspeed indicator? 
co-pilots. The right tube, the right P dot tube is going to the pilots. Again, it doesn't care about title up in the front. All it cares is the left and right side. Any questions about that? Okay. Next, we're going to talk about your static ports. We have two static ports, one located on the left side of the aircraft, one located on the right side of the aircraft. And you're going to notice that a lot of things use static pressure. What is static pressure going to be used for? One of it is going to be used to determine pressure altitude, right? Also, how is the airspeed indicator, how does the airspeed indicating system work? It takes the difference between that ram air and that static pressure and then it calculates airspeed, right? So both ports are going to go and you're going to notice the static ports are going to come into not only the AFCS computers, but it's also going to come into your vertical speed indicator, your altimeter, and your airspeed indicator process. Any questions about that? Now we're going to talk about your side slip slash yaw ports. They're known by both names. What you have is you have two on each side of those chin bubble windows. Y2, the top two ports, left and right, are for the number one system. The bottom ports for those, for both systems, left and right, are for the number two system. And that's how, how it dis distinguishes between the different pressures between the left side of the aircraft and right side of the aircraft. Now, as we look at the base of the computer, and we're going to actually bring the base of the computer up here. Here's the base of the computer. And there's the computer itself. And if this one was complete, there'd be 11 cards in here. Okay? For a long time, we couldn't do anything with these cards. But now, we are authorized to do certain repairs. We can replace cards. We can't do any work to the cards themselves. And they actually have test kits to determine once they do the repair that they did the right pair, repair and the computer should work. Okay, but that's what a card looks like. It lacks one card of having a complete autopilot. All it needs is a card that connected a navigational system to this computer and then you would have an autopilot capability. Keeping in mind, we said yesterday, this is late 50s, early 60s technology. The first time we're changing these computers is in the F model. The F model is the first one that actually changes these computers from an analog system to a digital system, which is going to be really neat. Okay, Even the G doesn't do that yet. Now, here's the base of the computer. As we look at the base of the computers, the only thing we're going to do now is reconfirm exactly what we just said as far as the different pressure static ports inputs coming into the system. And you can follow each one in here and see where it goes and you'll notice that this is marked your airspeed transducer. That's where it's actually processing airspeed and by now we know that that airspeed once it's determined is going to be used to program what? LCTs and and the dash actuator. Why? Because those are my two components that program the airspeed. Those are the two components that program the airspeed. You can see your side slip transducer, your altitude transducer, 
And if you marry it up, you can see where all the different static port indications come in for the different processes that have to happen. But what I want you to know is the processes are happening inside the computer. It's not the indicating systems that are sending their signals to here. Why? That's one less thing that can go wrong and cause a failure in these computers. By using the same systems that your indicating systems are processing to be processed by the computer, that's just one less failure you, we have to worry about. And then also inside of here, you have a yaw rate gyro. This yaw rate gyro is going to become important when we start talking about the fact that it's going to help with stability in the yaw axis as well as we're going to tell you that if you incur a yaw rate greater than 1.5 degrees per second, uh, heading hold is going to be momentarily interrupted. Why? If my yaw rate is greater than 1.5 degrees per second, what's going on with my aircraft? You're telling the computer that you want to turn. You're telling the computer you want to change. You don't want to have to fight against a system that was made to help you. Now, let's go ahead and nip it in the bud, okay? A lot of people like to ask, well, Tom, so you're telling me that if I incur a rate less than 1.5 degrees per second, then I'm going to have to fight heading hold. Wrong. Why? Because if you could incur a yaw rate less than 1.5 degrees per second and cause a change in this aircraft, then guess what the engineers would have done to the computers? They would have reduced it, right? They already figured that out for you. So if you could incur a yaw rate less than 1.5 degrees per second and it's still cause a turn or a change, then they would have set it lower than that. But that's one of the signals that's going to be processed for that. Continuing on, signals that are being processed by the computers. You got your vertical gyros. We have two vertical gyros, both located in the avionics closet between on the left side of this aircraft between station 95 and 120. We've already picked saw them one time. We've referenced them a couple of other times. But these vertical gyros is what's sending signals to the computers for your vertical references. But keep in mind, how many vertical gyros do we have? We have two. One, the left vertical gyro signal, top vertical gyro signal is going to go to the number one AFCS computer. Bottom vertical gyro, right vertical gyro is going to go to the number two AFCS computer, as well as the left one's going to which indicating system up in the cockpit? The co-pilot's indicating system. The number two or bottom is going to the pilots, keeping in mind that it doesn't care about title up front. All it cares about is the side of the aircraft. Now, here's an interesting fact. How many vertical gyros did we say we had? Two. You ready for this, gentlemen? We have one directional gyro. Just one. Okay? And unfortunately, I don't have as much backup as I'm used to, but I can tell you, as long as I've been around this aircraft, I have never replaced a directional gyro. And I've got 23 years around this aircraft. That directional gyro signal is not only going to be processed for your HSIs, but it is also sending signals to each one of those computers. So that one directional gyro is providing a signal to both ASCS computers as well as both horizontal situation indicators. On the bottom of that page we have an operator's manual note that says that if synchronizing becomes necessary in flight with the AFCS on, position the swivel switch to the unlock. After synchronizing is complete, position the swivel switch to the lock. This prevents unwanted yaw axis input. And we'll actually show you what we're talking about here in just a second.
Here's your power steering control located on your center console left hand side. On there is a three position switch. Forward is going to be steering. In the center is unlocked and to the aft is locked. It's going to correspond to either your power steering control on your right hand aft landing gear or your swivel locks on both aft landing gear. Steer position kind of makes sense, right? If I want to ground handy, ground taxi this aircraft with the power steering control knob, I go to the steering position. Lock makes sense, okay? As of right now, the only thing you probably realize is that on each one of those aft landing gears you have a set of swivel locks. They're hydraulically actuated down to keep those wheels in the trailing position. Why would it be important to keep those wheels in the trailing position? You're doing two-wheel taxi. Okay, so when we do two-wheel taxi, that's a one real good reason that most people don't get right off the get-go because they've never two-wheel taxied before. But yes, that is a fact. Also, keeping in mind, it's especially important when you two-wheel back taxi this aircraft. But what else? What? A roll on. Okay, roll on landing. Okay, what else? Okay. What would happen? What? Okay, what would happen if those wheels were allowed to just keep swiveling back there? What would happen to them? What would they act like? A rudder? A weather vaning? Sure. Does that help make sense? By locking those wheels in the trailing position, now it's going to keep those wheels from weather veining back there and causing unwanted yaw inputs, uncommanded yaw inputs, and that's the other reason why it's important. But as it says, if it should become necessary to adjust the gyrosync compass, and we'll show you that here in just a second, you go to the unlocked position. Why? Because what you are adjusting is that directional compass. Well, if I'm adjusting that directional compass and it's connected to my advanced flight control system, what would it be doing to my aircraft? It would be changing my heading. And when you, we talk about that here in just a second, you're going to find out that that gyrosync compass is very, very sensitive. And so it's going to take a little bit to fine tune it and get it adjusted. So you don't want, in the meanwhile, you don't want those uncommanded inputs. Any questions? And we will re-emphasize that in just a little bit. All you're doing is disconnecting the directional gyro from the AFCS, therefore crippling heading hold. Yes, sir. Your HSI mode select, keeping in mind that the only thing that this does, the only feature that this impacts is which one? What? What? HSI. How many, how many heading features does this aircraft have for you? How many heading features does this system have for you? Two. Two. What are they? Okay, so which one is this going to be part of? What process is this going to be part of? Remember that triangle we drew on the board? HSI is only part of heading select. Heading hold was an automatic feature where the directional gyro signal went straight to the AFCS. Heading select, that directional gyro signal goes through the HSI. We identify what? Command select, so we're going to talk about that HSI mode select panel here in just a second. Through the AFCS to now goes to the yaw and roll ilcos because why? Coordinated turn. Coordinated turn. And there's your HSI mode select for identifying which HSI that those computers are going to listen to. Because again, when we talked about instruments, we talked about the HSI. There's no difference between the pilot and co-pilot's HSI. And that's what it looks like when it's selected. Keeping in mind that what type of system is it? Is it a give or a take system? It's a take system. 
and we get in the habit of when we transfer the controls, we will transfer command select to. So whoever has the control should have command select. And there's both. Okay, now, red altimeters. Reality is, we have both red altimeters. We're showing both red altimeters, but technically we should only be showing what? One, the pilots. Everybody understand that? Because only the pilot's red altimeter is sending a signal. So why are we showing you both? Because since both those red altimeters should be reading the same thing, if the co-pilot's on the controls, which red altimeter system are they going to be using for indication? They're going to use theirs. But you have to understand that in actuality, the pilot signal is the one that's being processed. Does everybody understand that? All right. Now, I like this slide. This is actually one of my favorite slides. Why? Because basically, this is going to be able to be a quick reference point for everything that we've been discussing and everything else that we're going to continue to discuss. Why is it going to be important? If you look to the left of that chart, all the inputs that are being processed are on the left of that chart, which means all the components, all the P dot static systems, yaw ports, side slip ports, all the inputs that we've been discussing so far are going to be right there as a quick reference. Good? In the center is the actual computer itself, but we have to denote the fact that it is identified as a number one computer. Why do we have to notice that it's a number one computer? So we can discuss the aptitude hold feature. Everyone tracking? And then you'll notice to the far right is where all the signals are going out to to actually make the desired changes that need to be made. So it's a good quick re reference point. And for the most part, the inputs that are going to be applicable line up with the processes which line up with the outputs so that you can always refer back to this as a good quick reference point. So what are all the inputs? The vertical gyro, the directional gyro, the HSI, the horizontal situation indicator, the centering device release, the CPTs, the control position transducer, directions and amount of control inputs. Also, we highlighted what? what? What's a quick, good explanation of the CPTs? What's the process that's occurring? Why are those important to us? What does it tell the advanced flight control computer? Besides what you can read up there, gentlemen, I can read too. If it's a pilot-induced movement or not, that's what's very important. Because if it's a pilot-induced movement, you don't want it to fight your change. You want it, for it to allow for the change and reposition. But later on, when you get into the IP position, when you start tracking maintenance test pilot, and for you, it's going to be important already. Okay, because you're going right out to test activity. So therefore, you're going to have to understand that right off the get-go. That it also tells those computers the amount of change and the direction of that change to readjust the computers. But right now, at this level, as long as you understand that that's what the computers are processing to be able to identify, is it sensing a change due to your change, or is it sensing a change due to outside environment? If it's sensing a change due to your change, it's going to allow for it. If it's sensing a change due to outside forces acting on the aircraft, it's going to do the appropriate correction. Any questions about that? Feedback signals, and we're going to talk about that again here in a little bit. Thrust control brake switches, 
ANCS trim. When we talk about ANCS trim, you'll notice though it's only talking about what? Lateral, Lateral axis. Because keep in mind, although they call this the ANCS trim switch now, it it's usable in both the longitudinal axis of the aircraft as well as the lateral. But the only one we're highlighting over the last two days is the lateral, not the longitudinal. Why? Because you don't need the ANCS for the longitudinal. Landing gear proximity switches, PDOT tubes, static ports, side slip ports, red altimeters. Again, we had to denote that it was a number one ANCS so that we could show you the output going to the thrust CCDA. And then, of course, the LCT switches. Now, as we look at this, these are the Boeing schematics. Okay? But before we go into that, there's one more thing on the top of page 19 that we need to talk about. And we'll get into all those outputs that we just covered. Okay? Inside these computers is a built in test equipment system, which gives us the ability to push this red button right here and it will run a self-diagnostics on the computer. As a result of running those self-diagnostics on the computer, it will also make the control outputs. Meaning what? As it's checking a different system, those blades are going to move accordingly. Okay? So now, why would that become important for you to understand? What would be your concern? Well, once you, you're gonna, if you're going to push it, you're going to have to have electrical power and hydraulic power. Okay, concur. Sure. Is that a pilot's concern? I wouldn't want to push it without it. I might. Fall okay, but is, that sounds like a maintenance side of the house. Sure Why are we? Around the controls and the services. What? You want to make sure people aren't around the controls or services. Okay, that sounds like a maintenance concern. Why do you need to understand that? This system has built-in test equipment. How would it impact you? What would be your concern as a pilot? But you talked about it already. You, Make sure it's you were disabled in flight. You were bashing. Ah! Say that again, sir? Make sure it's disabled in flight. Make sure it's disabled in flight. I don't want to be flying along and have to be concerned that some knucklehead pushes this button and all of a sudden the aircraft starts to do uncommanded inputs. That would be a scary thought process, wouldn't it? So wouldn't you want to know that it's disabled in flight? Sure I would. Which means what? We need to understand how is it disabled in flight. What do you think would disable it in flight? No, sir. The engine condition levers, sure. The engine condition levers. If those engine condition levers are in any condition other than other any position other than stop. You can push this button all you want and nothing's going to happen. Now just so you understand the process, what's happening is when they run the test, what's going to happen is you got this hexo digital display right here and it's going to give you a series of numbers which is going to line up with the different outputs and it will give you a ballpark idea of what's wrong with the computer when we do the test. It won't fine tune it. There's another test kit that gets hooked up to fine tune it. But this will allow you to tell whether it's an ILCA, whether it's the computer itself, whether it's a CPT, whether it's any of the other sources of information that we are going to talk about again here. Any questions about that? So it is disabled in flight and it's disabled in flight how? The engine condition levers. The engine condition levers have to be in the stop position. Now, as I said with these schematics, these are Boeing schematics, gentlemen. These are Boeing schematics. Now, why are we going to be showing you Boeing schematics 
at this point, are the Boeing schematics really going to help you? Not really. Okay? So how can I make them useful to you? Let's talk about the processes that are actually occurring. Because you'll notice, when we talk about the pitch channel interface, you have the two dotted lines defining or signifying what? The two computers, right? The two dashed lines, or two sets of dashed lines, are denoting the two AFCS computers. And then it has a wonderful thing called the derived pitch rate. And that's great to know, that's great to understand. But if I needed to translate that into something that I could work with, to me it would be important for me to understand where does the derived pitch rate signal come from? Would that help you? Would that help you with these schematics a lot better? I think so. So where do you think that derived pitch rate signal would come from? What would make sense? What have we been using to process derived pitch rate or pitch attitude this whole time? No? The vertical gyro. The vertical gyro. So maybe you want to write vertical gyro there. Okay? So that you understand where it's getting that pitch signal that it's going to be processing for that derived pitch rate is going to be your vertical gyro. And then you're going to notice that it's going to send a signal out to the pitch dual ILCAs, the integrated lower control actuators. But then you'll notice from the ILCAs we got this thing marked FDBK, standing for what? Feedback. Okay, that's great. It's a feedback signal. But where did we talk about that feedback signal coming from? We did it under flight controls, so it's been a little while, right? LVDTs. The what? LVDTs. The LVDTs, the linear variable differential transducers. That's where that derived pitch rate, sig excuse me, that feedback signal is going to be coming from. Okay, and in specifically, you'll notice there's only one. So which one is it actually going to be processing? Although the feedback is going to come in the form of both the self LVDT for the process of what? The computer sent a signal out saying move. It needs something coming back saying that it moved. But it's also going to process what other LVDT that we have to make sure we're aware of. The what? Summing. The summing LVDT. Why? Because each one of those computers need to know what the result of both computer inputs are. And the summing LVDT is what it's going to be processing to do that. Does everybody understand that? Okay, and that's going to help for that stability augmentation, motion dampening in a pitch axis. What are we talking about? Again, as we're flying along, is it possible for forces to act in the longitudinal axis of this aircraft? Sure it is. Is the system set up to correct for that too? Yes it is. It's going to go once it senses it and it knows that you didn't make that input then it's going to go ahead and send out a signal to the integrated lower control actuators. Now, what else do I have to keep in mind? What are you going to feel as a result of that change? Zip silt's not in nothing. Why? Because the input's occurring at the ILCA. What did we say about any inputs that occur at the ILCA? The integrated lower control actuator. You don't see them, you don't feel them. Any questions about that? Now, are we done with the longitudinal axis of this aircraft? Not yet. What else do we have to talk about in the longitudinal axis of this aircraft? Dash. The dash. Okay, so as we look at the dash, we're going to look at all the different processes that are going on. And we're going to make sure that we understand. Pitch attitude. Where's that signal coming from? The vertical gyro. 
Good job. For what process in the ASCS? For which process? What? The airspeed hold. Not airspeed hold. The pitch attitude hold of the aircraft? Essentially still ma maintaining what? By maintaining pitch attitude of the aircraft, what essentially am I still maintaining? Airspeed. So what else do you think would be an important piece of information to understand? When is it going to process that signal? What have we been saying this whole time? Above 40 knots? Above 40 knots? Below. below 40 knots. It maintains pitch attitude of the aircraft below 40 knots. Which kicks us into the next one. Airspeed. Where's that signal coming from? What? The PDOT static system. PDOT static system for the process of airspeed. So now, what's going to be the important piece of information for that one? When's that process going to start occurring? Above 40 knots. When the reliability of the PDOT static system kicks in. And then last but not least, longitudinal stick position. What are we talking about there? That one sounds complicated, but actually it's the easiest one. It's just the process of you making a change to the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. But why did I have to show you that one? That kind of sounds like a no-brainer to me, doesn't it? So, so why do I have to show you that one? Because we got the ground contact, the ground proximity switches for the process of what? Reducing pitch sensitivity by 50% and what else? What happens to the longitudinal CPT in association with this switch? It cancels it for the process of what? Why do I have to cancel it for, altitude, at the, for pitch attitude hold? For the ability of this signal to be processed and stay. Why? Because this is a component. It's not a pilot induced movement. If it didn't cancel that pitch CPT or the longitudinal CPT, then that input would not have been able to stay. The computer would have sensed it as a change and it would have fixed it. Everybody understand that? And then of course the feedback signal still coming from the dash actuator inside of there, again, it's a very similar process. That feedback signal is nothing more than an electrical signal saying, you told me to move, I moved. Any questions about that? Now, there's one more thing we have to highlight about your dash actuator. We talked about the fact that it provides for pitch attitude hold below 40 knots. We talked about that it processes airspeed hold above 40 knots, but we also said that it provides for what? Positive stick gradient. Now, when we talk about positive stick gradient, basically we define positive stick gradient as the ability to put in a forward stick position, leave it, and know the aircraft's going to fly X airspeed forward put an aft cyclic, leave it, and it's going to stay. Agreed? But there's one more thing that we have to highlight. And what we have to highlight is the fact that when they first turn the AFCS off of you, on you, guess what's going to happen? They're going to have you back down to what did we say yesterday? A hundred knots. When they turn off the AFCS on you, what's going to start to happen is the first thing you're going to start doing is going to start slowing way down, possibly even coming to a hover. Why? What creates that phenomenon? And it's something that you, we do subconsciously. We don't even really think about it, which is why it's a natural tendency. Has anybody flown AFCS off yet? Okay. I just saw the cockpit look like yesterday. 
Okay. Well, they'll do it relatively quickly in the box because they want to see you get very disorientated and see how bad that that lack of an AFCS, if you're not aware of what's happening, can get the best of you really quick. But if you understand what's going to happen and why it's going to happen, guess what you can be prepared to do? You can be prepared to counteract it. So why do I come to a hover? Because you use too much F to, uh, to get the motion going. Normally the, uh, the AFCS will help. Yeah. OK, exactly. Let's translate it and make sure that everybody understands. OK? You were used to flying with a one inch stick travel and be able to fly 100 knots. Why are you able to fly 100 knots with only one inch of stick travel? Because the another thing that's embedded into this dash actuator is the ability to compensate for the amount of movement versus the result in the rotor. Because there's no way to really name it, they don't know what to call it. So it becomes part of this positive stick gradient thing. Okay? Otherwise, what would normally have to happen to allow you to fly the higher V and E's? You would have to be way out here, right? You don't want to be way out there to fly 160, 170 knots, do you? And you're going to fly, find out as long as the AFCS is on, you can put in approximately three inches of stick travel and be at V and E. But now, when you turn the ANCS off, you lose that positive stick gradient and now becomes negative stick gradient. But the other thing that you have to keep in mind, besides having to put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out, now you're going to have to put in more of a stick position, more forward stick position to fly that same 100 knots. And what's the other tendency? Keeping in mind, when they turn off the AFCS, the other tendency is the aircraft's going to want to do what on you? It's going to want to yaw around. So if you don't anticipate those two things, it's very easy to try to overcompensate, trying to get it back into what you need to do. And once you overcompensate, you're going to play you know what trying to get ahead of it again. Any questions about that? And the one thing that I use as a reference is if I can fly 160, 170 knots with about three inches of stick travel, maybe a little bit more than that, why do I need all that stick travel capability? And that's because when you fly AFCS off, now in order to fly at the higher air speeds, you're going to need that additional stick travel position. Any questions about that? Now, the roll channel interface. As we look at the roll channel interface, the big thing about the roll channel interface is I like to break it down and help you understand that when we look at the roll channel interface, the way we're going to look at it is from the different features that it's providing for. The different features that it's providing for. Now, when we talk about the roll channel interface, what features are we going to be associating it with? What features of AFCS are we going to be associating the roll interface with? Attitude. Altitude hold? No, attitude. Roll. Okay, but let's be... Roll attitude. Roll attitude. In other words, what feature? Bank and go hold. Okay, what else? Heading select. Heading select. Not heading hold, but heading select. Why? Because it makes what for me? A coordinated turn, which means that it has to be able to manipulate actually two axes. So you think we're going to see this again? Okay, what else? So we got bank angle hold. We got heading select, and the next one's kind of easy to forget because it's not something that you're necessarily used to. AFCS trim. It's got beep trim up there, but 
deep trim should actually be what? Lateral trim. In other words, the ability to roll this aircraft into a turn using the lateral AFCS trim. That's all going to be a process of the AFCS. And when we go through this, that's what we're going to be breaking it down. But the first thing we want to do is let's look at what we're going to be talking about. Okay? Let's go ahead and fix this. Because again, it's not user friendly at this level. This was made for engineers, instructors, maintenance people. That's what this was made for. So let's turn it into something that we can use. Okay, roll attitude. Where does that signal come from? Where does that signal come from? The vertical gyro. The vertical gyro. And it sounds childish, gentlemen, but it's reinforcement. If you understand what processes are going on, it's easy to understand that if I lose this, what other features am I going to lose? And that's why we're highlighting it so much. Now, we'll get into rate and sync in just a second. But you'll notice it might says beep trim. We already fixed yours. OK, yours says lateral trim. When we say beep trim, what happens? What's the mindset? Where does everybody go when you hear beep trim? Thrust or engines, right? Are we talking an engine thing? No, we're not. OK, so it's lateral AFCS trim. Bug error. What are we talking about for bug error? How far off the heading bug is. OK, how far the heading bug is or the alignment in relationship to that lever line that we talked about under instruments, it's called a bug error. That signal or that distance between where the heading bug is and that lever line, the system wants to negate that error. So it will result in turning the aircraft until that error signal goes away. That's what it's actually processing. And in lateral stick position, nothing more than what? You laterally manipulating the cyclic. Why do we have to have this one in here? We have to have that in there to associate what? The control position transducer for the process of what? Telling the AFCS computer that a pilot induced movement has occurred. As long as a pilot induced movement has occurred, the computers are going to allow for the movement. If it senses a change from your vertical gyro, not in conjunction with your stick position movement or the CPT movement, then it's going to say, hey, we need to fix it. Any questions so far? Any questions about anything we covered so far? Then what I want you to do is I want you to go to page 21. I want you to go to page 21. As you look at the bottom of page 21, what I want you to take note of, if you look at the bottom right hand corner of that picture, towards the bottom of that picture, you'll see a dark black area and you'll see a bell crank with a set of control stops, one to the left and one to the right. Does everybody see that? Okay, I want you to circle that and I want you to write four degrees of slope. These are the stops that are affected and which is why you may not have the minimum of seven inches forward, four inches of aft in relationship to the programming of the dash. Does everybody understand that? So that operator's manual caution about the four degrees of slope, this is why. Now, just so we make sure that everybody's on the same sheet of music, that is the bottom right hand side or forward portion of the flight control closet as you are facing it. So you can see where the dash comes in and due to the dash extending or retracting, those stops may contact sooner 
or later than what they would on the level surface. So that's the thrust just on the other side of that? That would be the thrust bell crank just on the other side of it, yes sir. Which, which one of those components here was the one you're talking about that gets the bend in it from the... Oh, that's way up top. Up in the top? That's up in the top, yes sir. That's it. Shut down a four degree slope. Right? Yes sir, yes sir. If you do not do flight control travel and hydraulics check, you will never notice that seven and four degree change. Does everybody understand that? So if I fly in, here we go, here's my slope. If I fly in and I put it down on the slope, IP says, great job, let's go home. And we go home, you'll never notice it. But if I shut down, we walk away from the aircraft or we have to restart the aircraft, See, that's why downslopes are so hard. The ground will actually give out from underneath of us sometimes. Okay, but if we walk away and then get back in the aircraft and go to crank it back up, when we go to do flight control travel on hydraulics, check. As a result of being parked on this slope, as a result of that dash either being extended or retracting depending on whether it's a downslope or an upslope, okay, that's when it's going to be affected. Any questions about that? All right. And I just wanted to make sure, since we added that, I wanted to make sure that you saw that. Okay, now we're going to go back to page 22. And let's go ahead and just run down. The ro roll axis. The ILCA, the integrated lower control actuator, is part of the stability about all axis, too. Okay, which is something that we didn't really highlight. We talked about the fact that we were going to talk about bank angle hold. We talked about, we were going to talk about lateral AFCS trim and that we were going to talk about heading select. But it's also part of the stability about all axis. Meaning what? Meaning if that computer via the vertical gyro senses a change, not in conjunction with a CPT input, then that computer is going to say, hey, something's manipulating my roll axis. It's going to sense that change and it's going to make the change applicable and it's going to happen where? At the extensible length portion of your roll integrated load control actuators. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Now, this rate. The rate is, if I have a bank angle greater than 1.5 degrees per second, what are we talking about now? If I'm at a 5 degree bank angle, are we talking about that when we talk about 1.5 degrees per second? No. We're talking about the time that it took for me to go from here to there. Now, what it's going to happen, what would I want to happen to bank angle hold if my roll rate is greater than 1.5 degrees per second? I want it to momentarily interrupt bank angle hold to allow for the change. And the same rule of thumb applies. If I could achieve a roll rate less than 1.5 degrees per second and still incur a change, then the Boeing engineers and the computer engineers would have said, hey, we need to set it lower. So they determined 1.5 degrees per second was more than sufficient to allow that interruption to allow you not, have, not to have to fight the whole feature or feature that was meant to help you. Any questions about that? Where's that rate signal coming from? That's actually going to come from the vertical gyro. And here's what I also like to do. Keep in mind, what can be used to d interpret some of these movements? If we're talking roll rate, unless I had a roll rate gyro or a roll gyro, what else do I have? I don't. So where would it come from? What else is used to determine roll? 
my vertical gyro signal. We just have to make sure that it's implied or it's understood that if I have a roll rate as well as a yaw rate greater than 1.5 degrees per second, my hold features are going to be interrupted. Why? Because my hold features, bank angle hold, heading hold, are automatic features. Which is why I said I get excited, right? Besides the fact that I like teaching this stuff. Okay? But because they're automatic features, they're smart enough to know when to turn themselves off to allow for a change, to allow for a movement. And then as soon as that condition goes away, then it'll turn itself back on automatically. And that's important as a pilot that you understand when those are occurring. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's make sure we roll down, we run down it. Okay, bank angle hold. Basically, it's going to use the vertical gyro signal, interprets what the bank angle is you wish to maintain, and then it's going to maintain that bank angle, keeping in mind that how's it going to do it? Just like you, what's going to happen at that roll ilka? Extend, retract, extend, retract, extend, retract, extend, retract. Why? Because it, that's exactly what it's going to have to do to maintain that bank angle or that hold that you want uh, to be accomplished. Any questions about that? Bank angle hold is disengaged any time of the, any of the following occur. Let's look at them. Why am I worried about bank angle? What type of feature is it? It's an automatic feature, so therefore we have to know when is it going to turn itself off. So when does it turn itself off? When a centering device release is pushed. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Why? If I push the centering device release, what's my intent? To incur a change. So therefore I'm telling the computer, hey, I'm getting ready to make a change. And bank angle hold heading hold is going to be momentarily interrupted. Right now we're just focused on bank angle hold. Why? Because what we're talking about is the roll interface, the roll channel. The cyclic is moved laterally. What is actually turning it off by me moving the cyclic laterally? The bank angle greater than 1.5. Exactly. Exactly. Heading select is engaged. Kind of makes sense, right? Heading select is a superior system that can have control of how many axes? Two. Roll and yaw. So therefore, of course, it's going to be turned off. And lateral ASCS trim is moved. But again, what is actually going to be turning it off? Roll rate. I roll rate greater than 1.5 degrees per second. Everybody tracking on that? Which is what it's saying down there. Bank angle hold will not resume until the roll rate is less than 1.5 degrees per second. And lateral ASCS trim, I think we've talked about over and over again. Now we're going to talk about heading select. But when we look at heading select, we're going to talk about the entire process that has to be accomplished before engaging heading select. So it's going to get a little bit more in depth. Heading select automatically turns a, or produces up to a standard rate turn. Yes, gentlemen, the turn or the amount of turn will be proportional to the amount of change requesting. It's not automatically going to go into a standard rate turn. Does everybody understand that? Operation AFCS must be on. Airspeed must be above 40 knots. Be sure the gyro sync compass is synchronized. This is your gyro sync compass. This is when they talk about the plus and the ball. You're looking for it to be aligned. What is it actually adjusting? It's a, a, adjusting that magnetic compass in the back. or that, That's feeding what? What's it feeding its signal directly to? The directional gyro, right? 
which is feeding what? The AFCS computer, which is resulting in what? What process are we worried about? Heading. heading hold, right? Why heading hold? Why not heading select? Why am I more concerned about heading hold? It's an automatic process. It's an automatic feature. Can you turn off heading hold? I can turn off heading select, can I? But I can't turn off heading hold short of doing what? Okay, that's what we're looking for, but short of turning off or pulling the electricity to the AFCS. Okay, either turn the AFCS off or cripple it somehow. Other than that, heading hold is as long as the AFCS is on, you're going to have heading hold feature. Okay. So how do we adjust the gyrosync compass? Again, we talked about we have to go to the unlocked position. We adjust the gyrosync compass and align it if that becomes necessary in flight. To the best of my knowledge, I've never heard of anybody adjusting it in flight. Once we adjust it on the ground, it pretty well stays adjusted. But it's just a consideration that you have to keep in mind. Okay. Then we have to rotate the heading bug to where we want it to be, keeping in mind that we can line it up with the lover line if we want, or when we go ahead and engage it, if we want the aircraft to go into an immediate turn, we can do that too. We got to make sure the aircraft is in trim. Why? Because it's not a trim fixer, contrary to popular belief. It will not automatically fix the trim for you. So if you are out of trim, when you engage it, it will maintain the aircraft out of trim. Any questions about that? Uh, trim force, press the centering device release. Why? Because a lot of times we make changes without pushing the centering device release until we're ready. So if you have a change in there to keep it in trim or to align something, if you don't push the centering device release and tell it to stay there, it'll remember it based on the old setting. And then press AFCS heading select located on your AFCS control panel, top left hand button. And the aircraft can be changed now by rotating your heading bug. Based on what? Based on that error signal. Do we need to talk about heading select anymore? Okay. Now, heading select will disengage. Now, we have to emphasize and we have to understand, heading select will disengage when we do any of the following. Why do we have to do that? For heading hold and bank angle hold, what did the system do? it momentarily interrupted it, right? As soon as that change was incurred, what happened to the system? It automatically turned itself back on, right? If we do any of these with heading select engaged, it will turn off heading select. Heading select will not automatically re-engage itself. What? if your airspeed drops below 40 knots. Why? Because what was it using to keeping the aircraft aligned and maintaining whatever you had maintained with heading select? It was using your PDOT static system for the process of what? Being able to distinguish the difference between the left side of the aircraft and the right side of the aircraft so that it knew how to maintain the aircraft in trim. Well, if it was using, bless you, the PDOT static system to do that, and the PDOT static system signal goes away, what's going to happen to heading select? It's going to disengage itself. Okay? The centering device release is pressed. Now, what's going to happen to heading select as soon as I release this switch? Nothing. It does not automatically re-engage itself. Everybody understand that? Command select is pressed on the other side. In other words, I had everything set up on the right. The person sitting in the left seat for some reason 
push command select, whether it was intentional or inintentional is irrelevant. If they push command select on the other side, excuse me, yeah, command select on the other side with heading select engaged, it will automatically disengage heading select. When will it re-engage heading select or how will heading select be re-engaged? When you reach down on the AFCS control panel and you re-engage it. If you do not re-engage it, it will never ever re-engage itself automatically. What about if you make fine adjustments using the lateral trim? Uh, lateral trim is disabled. Good question. It's actually covered on the next page. Lateral AFCS trim is disengaged. You cannot adjust it laterally using the AFCS trim. Which is the next thing we were getting ready to talk about. These features are disengaged when heading select is engaged. Bank angle hold makes sense, right? Heading hold is disengaged. Makes sense, right? But last but not least, Lateral AFCS trim is disengaged. When will those re-engage themselves? As soon as heading select is disengaged. But now, we need to show you the YAW interface because why? In order to make a coordinated turn, it has to be able to manipulate both the roll and the YAW axis. But when we look at the yaw axis, what processes are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about heading select. We're going to talk about heading hold. We're going to talk about coordinated turn. So we're going to be continuing on. Why? Because the yaw channel interface is part of the heading select feature of the AFCS2. So let's look at the different signals. And I like the yaw. Watch this. Roll right into the yaw. Where does that signal come from? Gyro. Very good. Very good. Vertical gyro. Yaw rate. Where does that signal come from? from the yaw rate gyro in the AFCS. The yaw rate gyro in the AFCS. We're batting a thousand so far. Side slip, do we need to talk about that one anymore? No. Pedal position. Why do we have to show pedal position? What else do we want to show? The y'all control position transducer, CPT. Any questions about that? And then heading stave sync logic. What's that? What's that? Is that where it kind of puts everything together so it, it all does it at the same time? Or is it? No, not what we're looking for. What other signal are we le leaving out for the yaw channel that's going to become very important? Something, well, something from the directional gyro? The directional gyro! This is the signal from the directional gyro. So look at all the gyros that are now part of this. You got your vertical gyro, you got that yaw rate gyro that's inside the base of the computer, and you have your directional gyro. For what processes? Again, heading hold, heading select, coordinated turns. Those are all the processes that we're going to start highlighting now. Okay? So if you look at the yaw axis, stabilization augmentation, again, it's going to be processing those gyro signals for the process of helping to stabilize the yaw axis of the aircraft. Side slip stability. That's your side slip coming in. Why? It can actually distinguish between the differential pressure between the left side of the aircraft and the right side of the aircraft and it's actually maintaining that pressure. Heading hold. Heading hold will maintain the aircraft within five degrees 
of what your directional gyro signal is saying within five degrees. That's nice to know. Heading hold is off. Why do we have to highlight this? What type of feature is heading hold? Automatic. So we need to know when is it going to turn itself off. When the swivel switch is set to the steer or unlock. Makes sense, right? If I go to the steer position, my intent is to be able to turn the aircraft using my power steering control knob. We'll show you that here in a little bit. Okay? If I go to the unlock position, as we discussed earlier, that's going to disconnect this signal from the AFCS for the process of what? Crippling heading hold so I can adjust my gyro sync compass in flight should that become necessary. Centering device release is pressed. Again, when I push the centering device release, my intent is to change something on the aircraft. So therefore, the computer needs to know that so it'll allow for the change. Or the pedals are moved. Now you'll notice we're talking heading hold, right? Now you'll notice, as per your question earlier, Jeff, lateral AFCS trim is used above 40 knots. Why 40 knots? Because that's when those signals kick out. Below 40 knots, our P dot static system, which it's using, and side slip system, which it's using, becomes the signals become unreliable due to rotor wash and other influences that are factoring in. So therefore, all of this goes away below 40 knots. Why is that going to be important to understand? What happens if I, I'm on turnout after taking off and I have to make a turn but I haven't reached 40 knots or got above 40 knots yet? What's going to happen? What am I going to have to do? You have to turn the aircraft just like any other aircraft. Meaning what? Meaning you're going to have to move both cyclic and pedal to coordinate the turn below 40 knots. Why? Because we're going to lose heading hold as well as coordinated turn. Cyclic is moved laterally above 40 knots. And then of course, as we just said, if heading select is engaged. That's when heading hold is going to momentarily interrupt itself. So once you get outside of those parameters, then it will automatically re-engage itself. Heading hold will not resume until your yaw rate is less than 1.5 degrees per second. We've highlighted that a couple of times. Your bank angle is less than 1.5 degrees at air speeds above 40 knots. Coordinated turn. With AFCS on, a coordinated turn is an automatic feature into the yaw input. With AFCS on at air speeds above 40 knots. Why for above 40 knots? We've already highlighted it. What's it using? It's using your side slip and your static ports to determine the differential pressure between the left side and right side of the aircraft. That's what it's maintaining. Any questions about that? AFCS off at airspeed is below 40 knots. The pilot must make the input. We already talked about that. Any questions about your yaw axis, your yaw interface? Now we're going to talk about altitude hold. Keeping in mind, how many types of altitude hold features do we have? We have two. We have bare altitude hold and we have red altimeter hold. The first one we're going to talk about is bare altitude hold. And talking about bare altitude hold, at straight and level flight, wings level, the aircraft will maintain an accuracy of plus or minus 25 feet. Well within acceptable parameters. If you have a turn incorporated or it has any type of angle of attack on the blade, the accuracy is plus or minus 50 feet. And the control inputs are going to be accomplished where? Where's the AFCS going to make the inputs? Okay. At what component? 
at the ILCA, at the cockpit control driver actuator. Why is that important to understand? If it makes an input at the co cockpit control driver actuator, what else is going to happen as a result? Your thrust position is going to change. You have an operator's manual caution that says to prevent an over torque, do not enter moderate, excuse me, do not enter forecasted moderate or stronger turbulence with an inoperative, or excuse me, with bare altitude hold engaged. Why? What is turbulence? Pressure it's pressure changes. What is the aircraft actually using to maintain altitude? Barometric pressure. Why is that important to understand? Let's go ahead and knock it out. If I have bare altitude hold engaged and I adjust my Colesman window, what's going to happen to the aircraft? It's going to change altitude. Anybody else? Absolutely, positively, nothing's going to happen. By you changing the Colesman window, did the barometric pressure outside of the aircraft change? No, it sure didn't, did it? Okay, again, they take the instrument out of the picture. It's one less thing that can fail that will cause a possible failure of the system. Any questions about that? Everybody understand that? Okay, what is the aircraft using? The aircraft is using and maintaining barometric pressure outside of the aircraft at the time that you engaged bare altitude hold. Limit bank angle to a maximum of 45 degrees. Excessive bank angle could result in an altitude loss. Altitude hold will attempt to correct for the altitude loss and an over torque condition may occur. In other words, it's going to sense that the aircraft's losing altitude based on the fact that you have a greater than 45 degree bank angle in incurred or produced. And it's going to attempt to, but it may or may not be able to keep up with it. And that's why they tell you not to go into a bank angle greater than 45 degrees. Any questions about that? And again, it will do everything in its power to maintain that altitude. Again, it does not adhere to torque limitations, rotor limitations, PTIT limitations. It does not care. All it knows is that you told it to maintain a certain altitude and that's what it's going to do within the best of its ability. Operator's manual caution, large pitch inputs will result in rapid gain or loss of altitude. If altitude hold is on, an over torque condition can occur during large pitch down inputs. Monitor thrust control movement and torque measuring, metering during airspeed changes. Okay? Keep in mind, when we say monitor, what's the first thing that comes to mind? When we say monitor anything, what are we usually talking about? Instruments, gauges, exactly. Instruments or gauges. When we say monitor thrust, what are we talking about, gentlemen? Your hand on the thrust control. If that thrust control starts to push up through the ceiling, you're going to feel it. You're going to be able to push the thrust control trigger, momentarily interrupt altitude hold, and maintain control of the aircraft without over torquing, over temping, or over speeding the rotor. Does everybody understand that? That's why they are very, very sensitive about you removing your hand from this thrust control. Because with altitude hold engaged, loss of control can happen just like that. Those computers are quick. Which is why they never let you let go of the thrust control. Any questions about that?
To engage bear altitude hold, you want to go to the altitude that you wish to maintain. Now you're going to set it based on your altitude indicator. That's all you have to determine altitude, isn't it? So that's what you're going to set it to. And there's where the reference to making sure the Colesman window is adjusted right. Otherwise, when you go to think you're setting it up at 2,500 feet, you may be higher or lower based on an erroneous altimeter setting. Any questions about that? But it's not because of the computer. The computer doesn't care. All the computer cares is what's the pressure altitude at the time that you engage that system. How do you engage it? By finally pushing on bare altitude hold. In which case, it will memorize the barometric pressure at the time that you engage it. And that's what it's going to be using to maintain. And when you push it on, of course, you will get the engage telling you that it is on. Now, if I push the thrust control trigger, what's going to happen to altitude hold? OK, it's going to momentarily interrupt it. It's going to momentarily disengage it. For how long? until I release the trigger. That light will, will remain on, letting you know that altitude hold is still engaged so that you cannot incur a rate of change and expect it to stay because it's going to do whatever you tell it to do. Any questions about that? Any questions about bare altitude hold? Next thing we're going to talk about is red altimeter hold. Keeping in mind, now it's going to be processing what signal? The pilot's red altimeter. Why? Because the pilot's red altimeter is the only true red altimeter system. The pilot's red altimeter is the only true red altimeter system. Now, red altimeter Rate altimeter hold has an accuracy of plus or minus five feet. Gentlemen, I can tell you for a fact, we don't use rate altimeter hold very often. We don't use rate altimeter hold very often. But when we do use it, it's great. Rate altimeter hold has an accuracy up to 1,500 feet. Why 1,500 feet? Okay, that is the reliability of the pilot's rate altimeter or the rate altimeter system. That is the accuracy of it. So you have to maintain a hover at 1,500 feet or below to engage the system. Anything higher than that, can you still engage it? Sure, there's no safety feature in it to prevent you from it. And it doesn't know otherwise. As long as that rate altimeter is still on, It'll let you engage it, but as soon as that signal's lost, then it will disengage it. So as long as that digital display and that off flag is not present, you can still engage rate altimeter hold, you just can't rely on the reliability. Any questions about that? And again, where's the input going to be created? at the thrust CCDA, meaning what? What else are we going to encounter with altitude hold engaged? Movement. movement in the thrust control. Again, I have to allow for that movement to occur. And you never want to move that thrust control with that altitude hold engaged. Why? Who's it going to listen to? It's going to do what you tell it to do. Remember, this stuff is there to aid you. It is not there to take over the aircraft from you. But what's it going to do to that system? What's going to be the result of you moving that thrust control without pushing that thrust control trigger with altitude hold engaged? It's going to be slipping that clutch, which is not a good thing. Why? Because that arm is going to still move, 
based on what the AFCS is telling it to do. Any questions about that? Now, operators manual caution. You need to be careful because there's several ways they can ask you about your rate altimeter hold feature. They can ask you when is it allowed to be used. They can also ask you when is it prohibited from use. So you have to pay attention. Operator's manual caution, rate altimeter hold can only be used in forward flight over water. That's when you can use it, in forward flight over water. And under instruments we talked about why. Is there any questions about why you can use it over water? Okay. It cannot be used in forward flight over terrain. Why? Again, as it senses altitude change, what type of altitude change? Actual height above the ground changes. It's going to do everything it can to maintain what you told it to do to include it has the ability to over torque, over temp, over speed as required to do what you tell it to do. Any questions about that? You have another operator's manual caution that says failure of the number one vertical gyro with altitude hold engaged may result in an altitude runaway. If this occurs, if this occurs, disengage altitude hold. Why is there a possibility of a thrust runaway with a failure of the number one vertical gyro? The number one AFCS is going to fail. The number one AFCS is going to fail. That's why there's a possibility. Any questions about altitude hold? Just out of curiosity, the, looking at this schematic earlier as far as the pitot systems when we're dealing with barometric hold. Mm -hmm. You have your number one side feeding the number one AFCS, the number two feeding the number two. You got two lines from the yaw side feeding the number one and two feet. Now, is there any information being shared between the AFCSs? Or no, sir. None whatsoever. No, sir. As a matter of fact, those static ports are going to actually, if you follow the lines, will actually process through both computers. They do process it. Yes, sir. Okay. As well as the input from the side slips. But the static ports do process through both of them. So it doesn't really matter if we're operating outside of both on the FCS if we're operating in one. And it will still maintain it, yes, sir. Unless it's the number one computer, only because why? Altitude hold is a feature of number one AFCS only. So if number one is the one you have selected off, altitude hold will not engage. Now, it will allow you to push the button. Nothing stops you from pushing the button and the light will come on. But what will happen as soon as you release that button, it will turn off if number one AFCS is turned off. So if it's a number two AFCS failure, then altitude hold is still possible. Any questions about that? Talking about the LCTs. Reduces the angle of attack of the fuselage. We've already covered that. Helps to reduce fuselage drag, reduce blade flapping, reduce stress on the aft vertical shaft, and a more level fuselage at hover, and an increased forward airspeed. Have we already covered these pretty much? That's what the LCTs provide for. The LCT actuators tilt both swash plates. The forward actuator is controlled by the number one ANCS. The aft actuator is controlled by the number two AFCS. Have we already pretty much highlighted that several times? The LCTs will function with both AFCS on or off. Why? When I turn the AFCS off, what am I actually turning off? What? The hydraulics. I'm never ever turning off those computers. I'm never com turning off those computers. As we look at the LCT operation, we have our auto manual switch. In the automatic mode, we already said, the number one ANCS programs the forward LCT, 
The number two ACS program is the aft LCT. If I'm in the automatic mode, both LCTs are in automatic. If I'm in the manual mode, then both LCTs are manual. In the manual mode, they now react to these two switches right here. But now, what you're going to notice is you have a 60 knot box, you got a ground box, and you got 150 knots. If I want to maintain 130 knots, where am I going to put the needle? How am I going to determine where to put the needle? This is where your experience is going to come in. Your experience will tell you ballpark where those needles should be at the different air speeds. How do you fine tune it? If the aircraft has a slight vibration caused by them not being adjusted right, then you may have to make an increase or decrease on the LCTs to fine tune it. What else will happen as a result of those LCTs not programmed right? Your cruise guide indicator may be showing you or telling you that you're putting a higher amount of stress. You may still be on the green band of the cruise guide indicating system, but it may be slightly higher than what it's normally been operating at. And then your butt will tell you if you don't have them adjusted too. Why? Because you'll feel it. You'll feel it if they're not adjusted. Any questions about that? A cyclic trim indicator. The indicators are located on the center council instrument panel, top left and right. That's where they're going to be located. Okay? They're calibrated at air speeds and they will indicate an actuator failure. In other words, if I'm increasing my air speed and those needles are staying put, then I know I have an actuator problem. I may have an indicator problem, but I may have an actuator problem, which is why when you look at the emergency procedure that we're going to talk about in a little bit, basically if they were stuck at 140, then we're going to maintain 140 knots for as long as we can. Keeping in mind that if we can do a roll-on landing, we might be doing a roll-on landing. Why? Because that might, that's going to cause a lot less adjustments having to be made. If I have to hover and it's stuck at 140 knots, you may get into an extremely unusual altitude to get this aircraft stopped. And I know two times, two situations where that has occurred. On both accounts, they were able to get it down to the ground just fine. Ugly, but they got it down to the, they got it on the ground just fine. Okay. Now, when we talk about the LCTs as they're programming, the first thing we need to remember is that in the ground position, basically that's allowing what to occur in the rotor system? The program tilt caused by what? The nine degree and four degree tilt of the transmission. They're mounted in there with a forward tilt for the purpose of what? ground handling, ground taxing this aircraft. And then as you increase airspeed, when you pick the aircraft up, based off of the um, proximity switch is saying that the aircraft's off the ground, that's going to tell the aircraft, hey, you need to go to the retracted position, now allowing me to do my hover work. And then as I start to increase my airspeed, those LCTs are going to start programming forward tilt, and we already talked about what they're going to be doing. Next thing you have to keep in mind, the LCTs are compensated. They're, they're pressure altitude compensated up to 15,000 feet, which is why you'll notice, or one of the reasons why you'll notice, that the LCTs, we only have 150 on the uh, high side of it. They'll still program a little bit in that and above 150, but once we get above that, they pretty much have programmed to as far as they can program. So now, as I start to increase beyond 150 knots, what else am I going to start to encounter? I'm going to start to encounter a slight pitch attitude change in the aircraft. But the other thing you're going to notice is that 
as you climb at different pressure altitudes, it's approximately three knots for every thousand feet of pressure altitude of change. That's what the breakdown is. Any questions about that? Operator's manual. Prior to entering moderate or stronger turbulence, turbulent air, the following should be accomplished. Longitude cycle trim, select manual. Why? What's it using to process airspeed? Your P dot static system. What's going to happen if you enter tor moderate to severe turbulence? with those LCTs, programming in automatic. They're going to sense those fluctuations in airspeed based on that turbulent air coming into the PDOT system and they're going to program accordingly. And that's why you have to go to the manual position. Any questions about that? All right, gentlemen. Here's another one of my favorite slides. But reality is, it's not going to make a bit of difference to you, really. Not at this point. But what I am going to recommend is after we do electrical class, come back and look at this slide. The basic gist that you need from this slide right now is everything for the number one system is associated with the number one electrical system. Everything for the number two system is associated with the number two electrical system. Now, I will help you with the fact that here's all the different bus that we're going to be talking about. We're talking circuit breakers, the different processes that are occurring, and last but not least, to the far right are the circuit breakers that we're talking about. And that's why this is a good reference slide, but the only problem is, reality is, covering what's on what really is not going to benefit you too much right now. Because I can tell you something works off the essential DC bus, but what does that mean to you right now? Nothing. Okay. Or as my partner likes to say, zip silch not and nothing. Okay. So once you get electrical class, come back and reference this. This is an awesome slide. Now we're going to go ahead and describe the limitations and emergency procedures should be on page 31 of your handout. As you look at page 31, the first thing we're going to talk about is single AFCS airspeed limit. Single AFCS airspeed limit is what? 100 knots or V and E, whichever slower. Now, for the most part, we've said that a single AFCS will fly this aircraft just fine. So why am I reduced down so drastically if a single AFCS will fly the aircraft just fine? Because you can have differential LCT. LCT should still program. Why am I reducing it so much? You already talked about it. You already talked about in the event that you turn the AFCS completely off and how much Travel, you now have to control, be prepared for. If you end up losing this this one in a failed state, it could be that much worse if you were that much faster. Okay, let's translate what he said. Okay, basically flying on a single AFCS, although you don't feel anything and don't know anything other than you have that light on, what would happen if that second one takes a crap? unexpectedly and you're going relatively quickly. You could be in a world of hurt. You may not have the reaction time to get control of the aircraft, which is why they want you to slow down. Now, after you slow down, what's the other underlying step to a single AFCS failure? Isolate. No. Airspeed reduced to 100 knots or V&E, whichever slower, and altitude adjust. Now normally when we think altitude adjust, we think what? 
What's your mindset? Get down, right? Be prepared to put it down on the ground. On this case, what do we want to do? You want to get up. Why? That way you have a, more of a fudge factor between trees or obstacles or stuff like that to get control of the aircraft should it become necessary. And that's why they want you to adjust your altitude and it should be adjusted up. Give yourself some room between the ground or obstacles so that if that second system does unexpectedly quit, you're going to have reaction time. Any questions about that? Now, here we go. In talking about single AFCS, one of the things about single AFCS, how long do you think you want to fly single AFCS? At 100 knots or less, that's not fun on this aircraft. So common sense says you'll probably want to do what later on? Land as soon as practical. No. You can still fly the mission all day. What? Turn it off. Turn it off. Because now I'm limited to what? 160. 160. Now the next thing everybody worries about is 160. Yes, you're going to lose the dash. But we already said if I turn the dash off, this just becomes a very expensive what? Connecting rod. So therefore, I'm still going to have full range of travel. So where does the 160 come in? Besides the fact that a lot of people don't feel comfortable flying faster AFCS off anyway. Why? Because now you're working your fanny off. Now you're having to sit in there, put it in, take it out, 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 and trying to stay ahead of this aircraft. And in your mind, it's going to be very, very hard to say, I'm working my tail off and you want me to fly faster? It just doesn't compute. But reality is, the aircraft is designed to fly faster AFCS off. Why? What do we have to aid us AFCS off on this aircraft? Underneath the aft portion of the aircraft, underneath the fuselage, you got what's referred to as strakes. Mounted to the ramp, you have strakes. You got it, the blunted aft pylon on this aircraft. You'll notice when the A model Chinook first came out, it had a pointed aft pylon. And now it's got a flat back aft pylon. That aids in the aerodynamic tendencies of this aircraft. And last but not least, you have spoilers right here. And that is all helping stabilize this fuselage and fly this air aircraft AFCS off easier. That's the purpose of those. Where do I find that information? In chapter 8 of your dash 10 under flight characteristics. It will tell you that that's the purpose of those parts on the fuselage. Any questions about those? Dual AFCS, failure. We already talked about the airspeed limitation. 160 knots or VNE, whichever is slower. But now, for some reason, this is one of the emergency procedures that messes everybody up. And that is, when I get both those lights, I have one underlying step. And that one underlying step is to do what? AFCS system select switch off. Sounds kind of easy, doesn't it? So why do everybody have so much problems with it? Because when I see those lights, what does that tell me about the system? AFCS is off, right? Oh, already done. No, it's not done. So why am I physically having to reach down there and turn the system off if my lights already say that it's off? You don't want it cycling on and off. And all you're doing is redundantly turning it off. That's all you're doing. Any questions about that?
Now, under hover check on the bottom of page 31, page 8-19 of your dash 10. When we do a hover check and we're checking the AFCS, what are we doing at this point? We talked about on startup and checking it. We said that we were doing what? Letting the dash reset. We're checking the lights and we're letting the dash reset or ensuring that the dash is reset, which is identified to us by what or how? Okay, one says lights going out. Say that again, sir. Okay. Okay, the AFCS lights are going to remain on, stay on, be on until the dash is repositioned. As long as you avoid what? Comes on. Comes on implies what? the lights were out. Were the lights ever out? No. Okay, so now we're at hover and we're going to do the check. Now what am I looking for? Now what I'm looking for is something called an engagement error. What is an engagement error? When you turn off or select one system over another, what's also happening is that locking pin underneath those authority covers are kicking into place. That's supposed to be a smooth transition. Should be not noticeable by you at all. Okay? But sometimes what happens is depending on how it's adjusted, it may be an abrupt change and you may feel it. That's called an engagement error. That's what you're feeling for. Now, the problem is when we're checking it, we're sitting there trying to hover this aircraft. We're still fairly new. So sometimes you may have to distinguish between is that me or is that the system? And there's no harm, no foul. And if you're not sure, just try it again. Go back to both and try it again. If you're still not sure, say, hey, the good captain's on the control. Hey, Jeff, check it for me. Tell me what you think. Well, oh, feels like an engagement error to me. Okay. Then you know you have a problem. Then you're going to go back to both. Yes, you're going to be watching the lights at the same time. And then you're going to select the opposite system from what you just checked. Again, looking for an engagement error. Once you determine there's no engagement errors on both systems, you go back to both. Any questions about that? And engine shutdown, page 8-22. All we're going to do with the system is what? Turn it off. Actually, we already turned it off back where? After landing and before taxiing. Both those tell us to turn it off. Why? Because we don't need the AFCS on the ground. The only time we won't turn it off is if we're on the ground and then we're going to end up doing what? Taking back off again. You don't have to turn it off right then and there. But if we're going to be on the ground and before taxiing, that's when the other place is that tells you to turn it off. Any questions about that? And there's your hover check. Single AFCS failure, operator's manual. Malfunction of the AFCS can usually be detected by an abrupt altitude, attitude change, hard over or unusual oscillations in one or more of the flight control axis or by lighting of the number one or number two AFCS off caution lights. If flight is conducted at low altitude such as contour or NOE, a climb to a higher altitude must be initiated before the pilot attempts isolating isolation of the defective system. Why? Because as long as one of those systems is on, yes, they may be fighting against each other, but they're at least doing something for you. And since you're not sure, in some cases, if I don't get an AFCS off caution capsule, I don't know which one is the problem. And I may end up selecting the bad system, 
which is now going to result in me possibly losing control. And that's why they want you to gain some altitude first. Air speed reduced to 100 knots or v &E, whichever slower. Altitude adjust as required, and we already talked about that. Note, and this is directly out of your dash 10. A hard over in the opposite direction may occur when the malfunctioning AFCS is turned off and the functioning AFCS reacts on the flight controls. AFCS system select switch, isolate defective system, turn on number one. If not isolated, turn on number two. Basically all we're doing is what in this point? All you're doing is troubleshooting, gentlemen. And keep in mind, you are authorized in this aircraft to do this procedure. It does not constitute an emergency procedure. If the system is not isolated, AFCS system select switch off. In other words, if both of them have a problem, you're just going to turn the system off. Could that possibly be? Sure it could be. Dual AFCS failure. AFCS system select switch off. If IMC, land as soon as practical. Keeping in mind that if you were to lose your AFCS systems in the cloud, if you were to lose your vertical gyro or your altitude indicator, attitude indicator, there's a good possibility of becoming disorientated. Which is why, have you gotten a dual generator failure in a simulator yet? They haven't played any of their tricks yet. If you get a dual generator failure in the flight simulator, which is the only place they'll do that to you, what should be first and foremost on your mind? Restoring some type of electrical power. What is the only way that I can restore electrical power on this aircraft if I lose both my generators? APU. APU. Okay. The problem is if you take your time and go through the process of the emergency procedure for dual generator failure, loss of AFCS, you could be discombobulated and lose control of the aircraft. So you want to get that APU online, you want to get the APU generator on quickly. And then that way you can regain control of the aircraft. Because if I'm in the clouds with a dual generator failure and I lose all my vertical references inside the aircraft and I had none on the outside of the aircraft, you can see where it can get very easy to get spatial disorientation, get all those Met aeromedical problems associated with disorientation and therefore lose control of the aircraft. Not a very good thing. Where does, since we're talking about this, where does, where do I get the fuel for the APU from? Is it a separate line coming from which tank or? It comes from the left main tank. Is that the reasoning for the actual motoring of it to actually be like a prime? Are we priming yes, the APU? Yes, sure are. Before you go to start? Yes, sir, you are. That's why the three to five seconds making sure that that line is full of fuel. But now if the aircraft is flying and it's running, there's no fuel further back from that tank. No, sir. So it still needs to be primed. Okay. Yes, sir. And you're still going to have to prime it just in case because although it may be pressurized, huh? Where does that power come from? Well, there's actually, there's a pump in the tank, but the, there's also an APU pump for sucking the fuel out of the main tank. And that's what's going to ensure that that line back there has fuel in it. It's so long that there's a possibility that it'll drain back in. Or it, with the engines online, it may get incorporated into going up to the engines. So that's where you have to be careful, depending on where the lines connect that there's that possibility. Anything else? Vertical gyro failure, operator's manual caution. A vertical gyro malfunction will be indicated by an altitude indicator failure. Keeping in mind, what is the signs of an altitude indicator failure? An unusual look and altitude indicator failure. What else am I going to get besides that funky look? 
the off flag. The off flag in the bottom left hand corner. Okay? So it's going to be part of that and in conjunction with that you're going to get the associated AFCS off caution capsules. On altitude transitions, transients, if a vertical gyro failure occurs, pr produces as follows. Caution. A failure of the number one vertical gyro with altitude hold engaged may result in an altitude runaway. If this occurs, disengage altitude hold. Did we already cover that note once? Okay. No. A failure of the vertical gyro with result a failure of a vertical gyro results in the loss of its associated ASCS and should be treated as a single ASCS. So you'll notice the first underlined step is airspeed 100 knots or VNE, whichever is slower. Now, in the case of a gyro failure, we're going to take our VGI switch and we're going to go to emergency. Doing what? It's taking that indicator and slaving it to the opposite gyro. And slaving it to the opposite gyro, what is it in turn going to fix? It's going to fix the indicating sig signal only. It will not fix the associated what? AFCS. AFCS. So the selected AFCS select remaining system. LCT failure. If in auto mode, airspeed adjusts. This is one of the ones that confuses everybody because as soon as I see adjust, what's my mindset? Slow down. That's my mindset. But in this one, when they say adjust, they're talking about adjusting for what? Adjusting to maintain where it's stuck at. Very good. Okay, cyclic trim manual. Forward and aft cycle switches adjust for airspeed. If LCT operation is not indicated, in other words, we lose in the indicator, the forward and aft aft cyclic switch retract for 30 seconds before landing. That's in hope of what? Why am I retracting for 30 seconds? I'm hoping that the actuators are still working, it's just an indicator problem. That's why I'm retracting them for 30 seconds. When will I find out if that worked for me? What? Well, when I go to slow down. If I'm not having to pull in an unusual amount of aft cyclic to slow the aircraft down, then chances are that those LCTs retracted for me. Any questions about that? Keeping in mind, what other operator's manual caution do I have out there that I need to be aware of? I don't want to retract or, excuse me, I don't want to extend those LCTs beyond the ground box at airspeeds below what? 60 knots. Does everybody understand that? So I don't want to manually extend those LCTs beyond those ground boxes. In other words, I don't want to take those needles beyond here at airspeeds below 60 knots. Why? Because that's when I'm going to put that backlashing on the aft vertical shaft and that's not a good thing. That's where that operator's manual caution comes from. Dash failure. Keeping in mind the dash failure has no underlying steps. But we're going to talk about it anyway and the fact that differential airspeed hole fa failure will be recognized by pitch attitude deviations if dash failure occurs. Avoid nose high attitudes. CCDA failure. Again, the CCDA failure, there's no underlying steps. Thrust control lever, slip as required. If the CCDA, keeping in mind that as we look at the CCDA, we have to t talk about it from two different perspectives. What are the two different perspectives? A mag brake failure and AFCS input. It may not be programming to maintain altitude for us.
So we have to look at it from both switch, both perspectives, which is why right out, about barrel out switch disengage as required if it's not working. Any questions about anything we've covered so far? Okay, for the last almost six hours, we've been talking about the advanced flight control system for the CH-47D aircraft. Are there any questions about anything we've covered over that period of time? Yes, yes sir. Uh, if uh, the forward LCT gets a signal from the AFCS one and the and from the other one, if one of the AFCSs fail, how can they both still be operating? Because just because an AFCS fails does not mean that every portion of the AFCS computer is going to fail. Now, if it's a complete computer failure, then it will result in an LCT not programming. And then we just do what? We treat it as an LCT failure, not just an AFCS failure. We'll react to both. Good question. Anything else? 